uh, I'm going to be talking. Uh, well, the title of this is Castanet or uh, ORM via the domain of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so from the very outset, a very high level overview of what Dungeons and Dragons is. Very ironically, we were meant to do this in January, um, but we've had uh, it was postponed then uh, and postponed last month. It's very timely given this movie's just come out. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons originally based on a tabletop role playing game, um, where basically players get a bunch of skills, stats, and uh, generally do role playing of a searching searching dungeons and killing dragons. Um, for those of us a certain age, this is probably um, I enjoy. I've been playing it for about twenty years now. Um, this was my original introduction to it. Um, I suspect I'm probably the only person old enough to actually remember this cartoon, but that's okay. I don't mind. So the Dungeons and Dragons games basically controlled, or sorry, it, it has a rule set um, that's published by a company called Wizards of the Coast um, with the most recent fifth edition, um, or sorry, that's not true, but third edition. Um, they actually started producing uh, what was called a systems reference document. Um, this was basically the core rule set, and it was used to kind of allow uh, players to create their own content. You know, so basically using the the uh, the underlying sort of rule set, um, so that you know, again, big market opportunity in their part, where you know they can basically, if you know this, then you can play this. Um, but the convenient thing about it is it has, as I say, all of the rules uh, and, and data um, that you need to run the game. Um, and basically what we're going to do is just kind of play with that data a little bit. Uh, amongst this SRD, there's lots of different things. There's um, all the details of classes and how to play them, where a class is the, the type of character that you play, whether it be a, a fighter, a cleric, a ranger, or a, a wizard magic user. Um, it also has a bunch of stuff uh, related to those things and particularly of interest to me because wizards are the best class and they have spells. So this is an example of uh, a spell from the SRD. It's called Cloud Kill. It has a cast in time of one action. So whenever there's combat, it basically an action, basically everybody gets an opportunity to do things or in a round, um, everybody gets an action. And um, so in your action, you may want to cast this. The range is obviously how far it affects things. Components are uh, what you need to actually cast it. So in this case, it's a vocal and somatic. Um, so it basically requires some movements uh, and duration. Uh, it requires concentration um, and uh, it can last for up to 10 minutes. And then there's a description of the, um, of the actual spell. Um, Reading through the description, you can understand how often a bunch of teenage boys reference this uh, as as uh, an afternoon of consuming lots of junk food and not getting outside very often. Uh, it comes up. So basically, this is from the SRD, but what this can get turned into then is a bunch of JSON. Um, so you can see it down there at the bottom. Um, the site is, uh, I think it's. Uh, called 5e api um or 5e srd api it doesn't it doesn't really matter um oh sorry there, there it is dnd 5e api.co um this is just a fan site where basically they have made this available um i'm basically taking their their sort of json structures to work with so that's kind of the the high level overview as to what it is that we're going to look at basically what we're going to do is we're going to stick these spells into the end of uh, database and start working with them a little bit so at the outset, um, just to, to kind of give you some context, on, or, you know, or the, especially following the first talk, which was absolutely excellent, trying to set everybody's expectations. Uh, I am not a, I'm not a computer scientist, I am an engineer. Um, basically what that means is if you want things to run super fast, uh, you speak to Tiernan. If you want it running, if you want something running by, and it's, 6 a.m. and you need something run by 7 a.m., I can definitely do that. Um, the other concept of me doing my best is I'm currently on day four of COVID. Um, while it's going okay, I am still a little fuzzy in the brain. Uh, and then thirdly, um, Ent is something that I've just been looking at relatively recently um, because 
somebody asked me to, to do some work on it and, and it was kind of interesting enough that I thought I would share. So I'm still learning. Um, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to, to try and give them a, a go. But if I don't have an answer, I will come back to you. Um, I'll go find out and then come back to you. So all that in mind, let's get started. So this is some extremely generic uh, SQL code in Go. Um, so all we're doing at the top is declaring uh, two, two variables. And then next, um, just out of interest, can people see my mouse pointer if I'm wiggling it about here? Yeah. OK, that's grand. Just I've been trying to point to things and nobody can see it. It's a bit pointless. That's fine. Uh, so this line is basically making a query to a database, uh, selecting the ID and the name from a table called spells, where the name is equal to this question mark. This query basically takes this option and, and starts populating these question marks. And this basically protects us from a bunch of SQL injection. Um, if there's an error, log out fatal uh, and then basically it's different or closing our resource once we're done with it so basically then what we do is we iterate through our uh, collection of rows and we basically use the scanner interface to basically put the data from the row into the um into the two variables that we've declared up here and we're just printing them out here pardon me and then just accident this is fine. This is, uh, as I said, bog standard generic uh, Golang database code. It is straight from the standard library. It is uh, everything that we could want from a standard library. Um, and it's perfectly good enough and has been working well for, well, since, what, 2013? So, you know, why bother changing it? A couple of things that we could potentially change. Up here, we have our declaration of we're declaring an ID and a name. So we're declaring the ID to be an int, we're declaring the name to be a string. Okay, so let's, let's hold that in mind there. Then next up in our DB query, we have our select ID name from spells for blah, blah, blah. That looks awfully like a magic string to me. Um, it's just a string that's kind of existing in the middle of our code. Um, it's kind of disconnected. Um, we don't really, you know, it's one of those sort of magic values that uh, we don't tend to like too much. And then finally, just down there in that third, the third part, the row scan ID and name. So what we're assuming based on this is that ID, the ID that we're getting back from spells from this database is, or can at the very least be cast into an int, and that the name is a string. Ironically, get the API that I've been using, they use strings as primary keys. Um, so this would probably just blow up uh, with a panic, um, which isn't exactly ideal uh, if we're trying to, to write a production service. So with all that in mind, this is where we get to end. So end is basically a way to try and get around some of these limitations. Um, it's not to say that the problems that in this code, this code are unsolvable. Um, but it basically becomes a bunch of process type stuff as well as actual code and error handling. So ENT is an entity framework for Go. Uh, it is a simple yet powerful ORM for modeling and querying data. I love being able just to write, read off the slides. Um, it was actually created by Facebook um, way back when and released, I think, if memory serves, about uh, 2018, 2019. Um, it being Facebook, it very much sort of falls into their graph way of thinking. Um, if you've ever looked at the Facebook APIs, um, they're big into graph as, as basically kind of their, their source of data. And obviously GraphQL kind of fell out a lot of that as well. Um, so with that in mind, it basically, the, the logo that we kind of have here is very kind of accurate where if each of these is a, a, a table and, and then we basically are, these are basically uh, tables or nodes, and then these uh, nodes are kind of the relationships between them. Uh, and as we can see down at the bottom, scheme as code, easily traverse any graph, and statically typed an explicit API. And we're going to be going through that in the next the next couple of slides. 
So that's we're we're kind of going to skip over you know what an ORM is. We're going to kind of be going through all of that as we go through. Um, but so what I'm going to start with is our uh, point of schema as code. So what Ent does for you is it generates a lot of code, um, and that and that basically helps us with the type safety thing that the, that was the third point on us. So this first line is basically go run the Ent command new. And these are the entities um, that I want to create. So spell, damage, school, class, subclass. Um, spell is obvious, damage is obvious. School basically means that's the grouping of spells that it falls into. Class is the type of people who are the, the class or role of people who can do stuff. Subclass, don't worry about it. Um, we never do. Uh, so we run that command and then we, if I just do a tree of the int directory that it creates, it basically has created these files. So it's created a file called generate, which we'll get to shortly. And then it's created a directory called schema and it's created files for each of those entities that we've created, okay? So out of the box, this is what the spell.go file would look like. Um, so it's in the schema pa the package, which is fine. So it's basically a struct uh, and it's basically uh, using composition of the ent.schema uh, type. And then we have two methods on that struct. So we've got fields and we've got edges. So fields are analogous to the fields of the, of the actual table. So basically what we want to use is this file to basically generate, this, this is gonna be the schema for our, for our table. Uh, so fields are fairly obvious. Edges, these again are the links between the tables um, that we were, that, that we saw in the, in the previous, in the, in the logo. So filling that out a little bit, um, we'll do the fields first. So as it's a method, what we do is we return a slice of fields. And this is kind of interesting because as you can see, the spell itself is a struct. In the likes of Gorm, um, which is one of the other, it, it's one of the OG kind of uh, ORMs for Go. Uh, it basically uses fields and structs and then uh, struct tags to basically generate its, its schema. And this does it slightly differently where the the, the, the actual struct is it, the fields are held in this uh, in this method. So basically returning a, a, a slice of them. And as you can see, they're basically getting pulled from this field package and then you're basically declaring what the actual type will be. Um, so whether it's a string, uh, boolean, uh, integer, a time, and then these are basically all of the the um, the types that are kind of available to you. Um, that then basically takes a name, and then we can add things to those types. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, this is from the actual int uh, documentation. Um, what these actually return is a builder. Um, uh, and basically uses like a, 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 flu, a fluent API where you can basically just append methods to types as they go along, which is basically where you get this uh, kind of structure here. So field.string, uh, we're creating a field called ID. And what we've done here is we've set, we're setting a max length of 100. So uh, string ID is returning, a, this isn't entirely true, but it will explain the concept. It basically returns a, a string type. When that string type, it has a method called max length, and it will return another string type, which will then call the immutable method, which will call another string type. Which, and then you can see this basically goes along. But we basically end up with a an int dot field at the very each. Sorry, yeah, that makes more sense. Pardon me. Each of these returns an int dot field um, to return. Um, Okay, so, and here, sorry, just to show you down at the bottom, um, we have, we, we're declaring a default here, and um, we're also allowing us to update the default. So that's gonna become pertinent now. Okay, so part of what we're declaring here are validators. Um, so basically what this does is, 
whenever we're doing things, whenever we're about to do things to the database, what Ent will do, it will validate the record against the list of validators that you have here. And this allows you to perform some like rudimentary database things uh, against the data before it kind of gets inserted in. So in this case, uh, if I am trying to set the ID to a string before I actually act on the database, I will check to see whether the length is less than 100 characters. Okay, so it will it, it only performs that whenever whenever you're actually sort of doing the actual database stuff. It doesn't obviously do it whenever you you um, whenever you set the value as such. And again, down here with N, uh, the level, you're basically making sure that it's a number between zero and nine. And these are the various validators. Um, so for numeric types, positive, making sure it's not negative, and then uh, that's within a range. Yes, I could have used a range instead of min max, but there we go. Uh, and then various other things. So strings, blah, 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 um, for bytes. You also have the option of adding your own functions uh, for validation. Um, this basically means that, uh, for example, um, if you were doing some sort of uh, thing where you uh, would, be, uh, for example, needed to make sure that uh, the thing that the, your value starts with USD or GDP or, or anything, then you can basically perform that. Yes, we could definitely have done that with a, a regex, but you know, these these are the things I could just come up with off, off the top of my head. Uh, it also has the option of being able to set fun transforming functions so that, you know, whenever you set the data. So, for example, if you set the data as, you know, um, uh, in pounds, but you want it to be actually put into the database in uh, US dollars, it can, you know, basically do that conversion and then and then change the value. It's things like that. So. Uh, and basically, all it needs to do is satisfy this function signature. So, uh, so that's the fields. And then we have the edges. And again, this is where it kind of becomes interesting. Uh, so the edges are the relationships uh, between the different entities. So spell is obviously at kind of that noun. Um, and then the edges is the relation to the other things. Um, in some ways, this was a terrible domain set because naming things is hard, um, but I think we can basically show this. So basically, what we have, each spell will have a damage type. Um, it will um, have, it can, multiple classes can use the same type of spells. So for example, uh, a druid and a ranger can use plant D type stuff, uh, and each uh, each one has a school. Um, and basically what we, the difference between from and to, uh, it basically is defining who owns the relationship. Um, this is, it's more of a, it, it's more of a, a theoretical thing, uh, and as much as it, in some ways, it doesn't matter which way you do it because you know you can back reference and, and various things like that. Um, but it just um, for the purposes of your um, the ownership of of things, it, it kind of makes sense to try and do it. But for the from references, so basically, this is saying damage is the owner of a spell. Um, we basically reference the uh, the name. The, the the two name on the damage um, the damage entity, but all of this will become clear shortly. So that's kind of that's the spell. These are the other ones. Don't worry too much about reading them. I'm just kind of showing them in case anybody particularly cares. Um, actually, do, 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 do. actually, yeah. So there there's a reasonable one. So in our we had. Uh, from classes, and we are using the, the, the spells reference. So in the top left hand corner uh, is the is the class uh, file. In the edges, we have an edge to spells. Uh, so it's basically using that particular 
edge to 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 do the the, the back reference. So we have our schema. This is all awesome. How do we actually make database stuff now? So we go back to that generate.go file. This is the entire contents of that file. Um, basically, all it is is a go directive to uh, run this, this command to generate the schema. So looking back, this was our um, the contents of that ent directory uh, whenever we generated the thing. Whenever we actually create the, whenever we generate the schema, there are a lot of files created. Um, so again, sometimes the class was a terrible name for me to choose, but here we are. So well, as you can see, there's a bunch of files created for each of the entities within the schema. Um, and what this has done is taken that taken that schema and then exploded it out to create all of those types that we're going to be using um, to actually interact with things. And we'll, we'll, don't worry too much about this right now because we're going to, as I say, we're going to dig into this a little bit. So we've generated all of these files. Okay, we now have some Go code that we can, in theory, interact with the database with, but we still need to interact with the actual database. So to do this, we use a tool called Atlas. So Atlas, at the minute, Ent is uh, maintained by a company called Riga, um, who also have a tool called Atlas. Um, it's an open source tool. Um, they are building a cloud component around it, but the cloud component is completely disconnected from Atlas itself, if that makes sense. You don't need to use the, the, the cloud. You don't need to use any cloud stuff to use Atlas. So what cloud, uh, Atlas Migrate is doing here, it's basically wanting to uh, create the migrations uh, from what is currently in the database to our current schema uh, and how it is. So what we're doing here, so Atlas Migrate, obviously it's a command. Uh, we do a diff of the, and we basically just give it a migration name. Uh, this is just basically because part of the file name. So we basically point to our migrations directory. We basically say we want to go to the where we are in this schema. And then this dev URL basically says, here's a, a database where you can basically do this work. So it, it can utilize a lot of Docker, it can use an actual database. But basically what this will do is, if we're using Docker, and we'll, we'll talk about that just because it's easier, uh, it will create an instance of the uh, the database. It will apply the current migrations. It will then look at the state of the database. It will look at the state of the schema and it will basically figure out what migration or what it needs to do to basically make these two things sync up and then write all of that out into a migrations file. So once that's done, you basically end up with this file and that add underscore initial would be the, the, the file name that we provided. And then atlas.sum basically allows us, it, it protects people from just kind of modifying the, the, um, the migration spell. All very cool. What does that actually look like? It's just a, literally a bunch of SQL. Um, in this case, it basically is doing all of our create table um, uh, SQL uh, because it was currently empty. It's our first migration, so it's basically creating everything. Um, and subsequent uh, things, so for example, if we changed the, if we added a field, it would basically then uh, alter table to add the new field. Uh, and then to actually apply that, we basically Atlas Migrate Apply, um, use the migrations, and then um, you give it the URL of the database that you want to apply it to. Um, there's a little star there. Um, if you're... All, all of these slides will be, you know, will, will be available if you want to follow along. Um, what you want to add to the end of that generally is search path public um, to get the correct Postgres namespace and SSL mode equals uh, disable because um, Docker generally, or the Docker Postgres image complains about that now. Um, you don't have to do this. There are ways of adding it into Go to, to have it automatically generate itself, um, but Honestly, this was the for me, this was the cleaner way to do it because it also it 
basically gives you the opportunity to uh, get these in the info code review and things like that, um, and then be able to track them. So we have created our migration, uh, we've applied it. So we now have stuff in our database. Um, so these are our actual tables that have been created. Uh, and so these are the, um, the, the actual tables. And again, this is the Atlas Cloud uh, thing um, that I generated by using this mviz command on the right-hand side. Um, again, kind of of interest here is the, uh, so these are the field, the field names that I had. And then this damage spells, it is technically a field in the table, but it is because it's a, a one-to-many reference. Uh, basically, uh, it, this is the, the relationship um, that's then built to it. Um, what's interesting for the other one, for the uh, class and spells, because it's a many-to-many -many relationship, it has created the appropriate uh, table in the middle um, to, to, to basically sort that out. Uh, and then the other thing that gets created in just, and this isn't in this, but it is on your actual uh, database. If you go, you know, dump your tables, is your Atlas schema migrations. And this is basically where your schema migrations are actually tracked. So one thing to remember, because I keep forgetting this, um, anytime you change the schema, you will need to go through that cycle of regenerating the um, the uh, the Go classes, or sorry, the Go files, and then uh, creating a migration and then applying a migration. There's nothing more frustrating than uh, either applying the um, applying the migration and then not understanding why your classes don't actually have the fields available to them, or alternatively, you have the fields available, but whenever you try to write to the database, it says this fact, this field doesn't exist. So again, uh, save yourself from the hassle that I had and actually uh, make sure you do that, that regeneration cycle. Okay, so we're going to actually look at some of the stuff that we that we're doing. So basically, what I've done is I've created just kind of a really small site to um, basically kind of demo some of this. Um, the site will be available by the time the videos go up. Um, so I'll, the link will be on GitHub. Um, all of this will be will be freely available. Um, so just whenever it starts up, it basically asks for your database URL, and all this is is just this kind of URI. So Postgres. It's basically declaring the, the dialect and then the user, the password, the host name, the database, and the SSL mode equals disabled. And then whenever you uh, save the DB config, uh, that passes it through to this. Um, I'm just creating a really simple ant storage uh, structure um, that you could potentially make an interface out of um, for, for passing around and mocking later. Um, this new end storage is a terribly named function because all this will re all this one is particularly appropriate for is Postgres, and I'll show you why in a second. So all this is doing is it's basically open opening a, a SQL database connection uh, using again using the standard Go library, um, but it's using the PGX library. Uh, I'm just doing a ping here, just purely because this was a uh, because it's a site. I want to check to see that the database is actually working rather than assuming that it does. Uh, and then I'm using EntSQL to create a database connection. All this is doing is basically wrapping a bunch of the SQL commands uh, for Ent purposes, um, and uh, using the uh, Postgres dialect. And then what I'm doing is creating a client. Um, the client, if you can see this, so it's ent.newClient, but the ent package that we're referring to is this one. At the, it, it's our first line here, which is the one that we have generated, okay? So it's not the actual package. It's not the ent package. It is our generated package. So this is uh, this uh, package, the client that is creating is specific to the code, uh, the schema that we have. Why was this a terrible example of Postgres? Uh, it's primarily because I wanted to use the PGX package. Um, 
you can actually get away with um, using um, any um, using um, a function called ent open, I believe it's called, uh, where it'll basically take the dialect and then just the connection string. As long as you the the connector, the connecting library that you want to use is actually is SQL DB compliant, then it, that's fine. PGX isn't. Um, so you basically need to do some stuff around that. What dialects does it speak? Uh, MySQL, MariaDB, uh, Postgres, Cockroach, SQLite, Gremlin, which is kind of interesting because it's not necessarily uh, an SQL database. And then uh, TIDB, which is a, a time series um, implementation from what I remember. It's been a while, sorry, again, COVID. Uh, okay, so, but the interesting thing is you supply, you basically pass in your connection string. So in theory, I can, if I I'd set this function up correctly, I could make this, if I pass in a MySQL connection, Postgres connection, it doesn't matter. Ent is going to interact with the database in exactly the same way. Uh, okay, yep, sorry, I'm writing a quick note to myself. Uh, if somebody could remind me about uh, specific types after, that would be awesome. Okay, so, uh, yep, 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 yep. So again, so this is within the our ent client.go. So this is the client code that we've generated. So all you can see is, uh, yes, sorry, this is the end. This is the open, this is the simple version I was talking about earlier, where again, you pass in the driver name, whether it be MySQL, Postgres, or SQLite, and it returns a client. Again, doesn't care uh, what, uh, what you're using. All of that's going to be handled under the hood for you. So again, that classic thing of, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to do this in Postgres, but we need to make sure that we're able to go to MySQL if we have to. This is one way of doing that. Has anybody ever done that successfully? Well, okay. Ironically, Twitter was trolling me yesterday um, with me creating my end storage uh, struct and sort of wrapping a generic uh, re repository around it. Um, but it's kind of useful just because of the way I wanted to kind of demo the, the actual code. So, what we're going to do here is basically get all spells. Okay, so this is basically in SQL terms, this is select all from spells, except what we, the other thing that we want to do is we basically want to get uh, the related uh, damage type that it has and uh, any of the the, uh, the classes, so the, um, the, the role playing classes uh, that can potentially cast this. Okay, so Again, this is kind of why I, I have this kind of wrapper around this, uh, basically just putting this method on it. So the storage.client is that uh, end client. So the end client has a spell uh, field, uh, pardon me, uh, which then has a, a query uh, method. And again, we have this, this chaining thing going on. So basically what we're saying is we, we want to create a query, which will create a query builder. And we want to say we want the damage type, and then we want the the classes as well. Okay, what this is doing is um, it's doing eager loading. So basically, rather than us kind of getting the list of spells and then going and making another query to go and get all the damage types, and then going and doing another query to get the classes. It basically is doing all of this behind the scenes uh, using a fancy SQL, for lack of a better term. And I'll, I'll kind of go over that in a second. Um, and again, this queue, so basically you pass in a function here and the damage type, this basically allows you to filter out um, the, the various bits that you want. So for example, if we wanted to get, uh, if we wanted all of the spells with damage type acid, as an example, we could basically put that filter in there, and then that would, you know, that would basically reduce the the, the result set back down. Order is basically saying we want to order by field name, and then all is basically saying, okay, give me back all of those results. Other things I could do is first, last, 
those sorts of things. Um, so just flicking onto this. Okay, so this is the client. So this is the, the storage.client. So again, these are the fields. So this is our spell uh, fields. So it's a spell client. And then this, uh, so that would be that should be spell client, which is fine. So it has this query method, um, which is returning a query. Uh, and then the the query, the spell query basically has all of these uh, fields that we're basically using to interact with all of these other types. What's, again, the thing about this is all of this has been specifically generated for our specific schema. And what this allows us to do is whenever we're making this query, we are explicitly asking for the fields and working with the types that we have specified in the schema. Assuming that we keep everything in sync in terms of our actual migrations and, and our, our generated code, then everything that we're doing here is type safe. So where we were doing potentially that var ID and name and it being a, an int and a, a string, this is now being uh, this is now being checked at the actual um, compiler stage. Uh, so we're getting that that type safety um, that we that we really like and go. Um, so this is the this is what we get back. Or this is the same thing. Um, so this is this is us basically processing the results. So um, what the, as you can see from the return type here, we're getting back a, a slice of pointers to int spells or an error. And this is again just a, an HTML template. So we're passing through the spells, and what we're doing here is we're just accessing the field names from the actual spell. Uh, so again, we have the schema. It has then created the types. So the spell type we are now interacting with directly. Uh, and then for this line here, um, if edges.damage type, so we're basically acknowledging that this is a, an edge. What this is actually saying is if there is a damage type, so there may be a case where we've requested a spell, but it doesn't have uh, a damage associated with it, a damage type associated with it, because purely as an example, cure wounds or heal or you know any of those sorts of healing type spells uh, do not obviously have damage. Uh, and then we can basically reference the um, uh, edges damage type name. So that kind of makes sense. That's easy. And as much as, yeah, you're getting one back per you're getting one, you're potentially getting one damage per spell. What you may get, again, because it's a, a, a many to many relationship in the classes, is you could be getting back many uh, things in the, um, in for, for classes. And again, this is where it's kind of, it, this this sort of OR, ORM is a more pleasant experience in working with the actual sort of standard, our, our original SQL Go code. You know, so rather than going through each row and you know trying to dejupe and and pulling stuff out and putting things into slices and arrays, all of this is just done for us automatically uh, under the hood. So again, so we're we're arranging over the edges of classes because we know it's going to be a list, and we can basically just pull that stuff straight out. And again, using the actual types. Um, so just looking at this again. So we had with damage type with classes. So what we've done is we've basically taken our spell and we said, okay, with this damage relationship and with this class relationship, get me more information. The obvious implication of this is in this damage query, if we were in damage, we can then go and explore its relationships as well. And again, this comes down to the, the sort of graph uh, idea that it has where you basically, you can start on one note and then just start exploring the entire way down up. Um, it, it, it's quite powerful as a, as a kind of idea. And again, the nice thing about this, as opposed to SQL, for example, or sorry, using pure SQL is you don't have to worry about relationships and, and trying to, you know, trying to remember whether it's a left inner join or an outer join or, you know, a right join you know, it, 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 it removes that layer of complexity. Um, 
for this is again this is just kind of a very simple example um using a where clause so it's the same thing but basically all i want is uh the spells that have um a term in them the term that i put in here was fire um so basically it's gone if if, if fires in the name has gone pulled out those explicitly now again what we have here in this were is um we're using the spell uh this this uh, package that's been generated because it knows that it's a string it basically gives you the options of how in sql you can specify string related stuff and this name contains full this basically is a case insensitive search um so it also has spell dot contains you know so it basically is like doing a like for like or you know spell doesn't contain so it's doing it uh you know it, 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 for things that it, that it doesn't have um in a similar way for um uh the level as an example and um, because it's an int based one it can basically you could have a where um, level greater than six so you're only getting six level and above spells um and again type specific all of this stuff is now being checked at compile time rather than um kind of using um than, than runtime um and just as an example this is a an implementation in gorm which is the other one um again this is using the um the the, the fields uh rather than sort of generating the code um so you have things like um this db were name i like uh so you know so basically you have this and then this is don't worry too much about this you know search term aside from the fact that it's kind of more sql specific if this is bad sql then this fails at runtime not compile time um which is not ideal because there's a there's a, a debugging uh, thing that you're now doing in production um those are two really simple query or two sort of simple query examples this is i'm kind of using i'm cheating i'm using this for two different things so this is basically an insert so this is creating a spell um so again we have this client and um, we have this spell builder and then we have this create uh where it's using the create builder and again because we generated all of these types we can we have explicit functions to set id set name set description um and basically doing all you know setting all of these things uh for here if it uh if it has uh an, an actual damage associated with it we are then we can basically set that either to an actual instance of a damage type or we can potentially give it just the id uh, and it'll figure it out behind the scenes and same with classes as well the reason I'm using this to do two different things is because I'm creating an array here what I'm actually doing is creating in bulk um so rather than doing in this case 321 uh insert uh uh inserts I'm basically doing it all as one something else to be aware of here is this is actually I'm actually doing this as an upsert so rather than doing an insert because I'm setting the id it's not being generated. If, for example, I had inserted the, these values and then tried to reinsert them again, this would fail. Um, even if I had, you know, updated everything else about the record. So basically, what I'm saying is, if there's a conflict in the field name, do this. Um, take this course of action. As it is, I want to update these. New, I, I want to update the values. Um, so if you find a record that's already been created just update it alternatively you could you can have it um if you can have it that if there's certain fields that conflict you can basically stop it um to to basically from doing that um as you can imagine delete and um the other one nope gone yeah deleting is is is, is very straightforward Plus, you know, I kind of want to get us moved on. Uh, I'm more times pressing on. Um, so kind of going into the elephant in the room. Um, 
aren't, aren't or ORMs kind of evil? Um, on one hand, yes, there is a performance penalty. Um, you you know more you're running more code, you're generating more objects using memory. That's something you kind of have to take into account for. There's now more abstractions that you now need to deal with, uh, and the potential limitations of that. Um, you can't write the the handcrafted organic artisanal SQL that you maybe want to write. Um, and particularly with the migrations and things like that, you've now added more things to your process uh, that you now have to do. On the other hand, and speaking specifically about Ent in this particular case, those compile time safety checks are really cool. Um, it, it, the, the type safety is one of the things I love about Go. Um, getting, the, getting it as part of your, uh, your database queries is really handy. Um, other things, your common SQL is now optimized. Um, the people writing the the underlying library, you know, they're optimizing the SQL, you know, to uh, as uh, as much as it can be. There, there's eyes on this everywhere, um, so the the SQL is actually being optimized. Um, your migrations are now being handled as well. Um, I was actually cheating for the long, but previously to using it, I was actually cheating and creating work for myself. To be perfectly honest. There's, I know, I appreciate there are tools like Flyway and Goose that you can be used to do migrations. I was actually using Django um, to create the models just purely so I could use the admin interface and its uh, ORM and REPL to kind of interact with stuff and do the migrations. Um, database independence, again, you're using the same client, whether you're using Postgres or MySQL. How many people actually do that? Again, have never seen it done successfully. Maybe I'm not getting out enough. Um, one point, which is the note that I've made to myself, is the types that are listed, those are the, for lack of a better term, generic types that can be used. Um, they are, you know, that the, that is your database independence. So you can basically swap things out. It is possible to use the underlying specific implementations. So for example, if you wanted to use a uh, Postgres JSON field, you have that as an option. If you want to use one of the, the GIS or the post GIS fields in Postgres, again, you can basically declare that uh, whenever you're creating your schema. And security, you're basically getting a whole bunch of um, potential um, safety around um, SQL injection stuff purely because of how uh, all this stuff's getting called. Purely as an aside, um, Ent has the option of basically, because you're creating that schema, you can basically add annotations to that schema, which will then give you access to being able to export it via GraphQL server and gRPC and protobufs. Uh, not something I've used, but looks kind of handy, although I am kind of reticent to expose my database implementation to the um, outside world just purely from the perspective of um, making changes to your database, then it, it has potential, the potential of being uh, publicly, uh, publicly uh, affecting. Um, what I like, schemas managed in a single location, um, as I said, the type safety. Uh, no more looks good to me, SQL strings. Um, so whenever you're doing a code review, there's an SQL string, everybody kind of goes, yeah, that probably is fine. Um, I definitely didn't know enough SQL to figure out the 17 layers of inner joins on it. Um, testability, um, and then the community. Um, there's a Discord channel. The creators of Ent are in it. Um, they seem to be in it 24 hours a day, uh, and they're very friendly and helpful. On the other hand, I don't like checking in generated code. Um, they are keen that we do that. You do it at the it's a personal thing, but yeah, I'm still getting over that. Um, the documentation for generated code. So, for example, the uh, like the, the string related functions and things. You're, it's easier for you to basically have to pull up your own Go doc uh, locally to, to actually see what the files and, and things are. Uh, the documentation is good if a little sparse. Um, some more examples and uh, would be useful. 
and then examples in the web. It is a relatively recent uh, library, um, so there are just aren't as many examples as there are uh, for Quorum. That's me. Um, does anybody have anything they, they want to know more about? Again, I may not know uh, the answer, but I will I will give it a go. Um, yeah, so um, I know that with Gorm, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I know, I know with Gorm, it actually exposes you to be able to write SQL um, directly to it. I, at least I think I, or at least some ORMs let you do that. Is that an option with Ent as well? Like if you want to write, you know, your handcraft artisanal bespoke SQL, <laughs> can you also do that? I don't think that you can because it's it goes slightly against the ethos, but equally because it's again because it's kind of using that underlying uh, SQL.db type connection, just spinning up a, a, a connection for that, you know, it, it's probably not a a, a huge deal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I I think it, it's one of those things. It it's covering the the ninety percent of cases. Um, and it's one of those things, if you're writing the artisanal handcrafted SQL, then you're probably, you know, going back into a, a custom type anyway. So you're, you're you know, you're, you're kind of losing all of the, and that, that, let's call it the unsafe of the SQL world. Uh, does Ant have transactions? I'm assuming so, but. Yeah, yeah, it does. All right, sweet. Uh, any more questions? Sweet. Uh, that's you, Simon. Well done. That was unreal. No worries. Thank you. Um, it just as a, as I say, the code will be going up probably next week at some stage when the videos are going up. If anybody has any particular queries that they'd like to see an implementation of, um, I I am Tyndall. Um, you find me on the Meetup page on Twitter, GitHub, wherever. And just send me a message, and I'll 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 have a look. The man, the myth, the legend, hey. Yeah, <laughs>